out tonight. And I know I'm looking at the little uh, ticker and more people are joining us all the time. So um, on behalf of the T-Town community, whether you're familiar with us or you're new to us, I wanna say welcome. And I'm looking forward to, um, to listening and learning uh, tonight along with you all. So um, with that, I'm gonna pass it off to uh, Danielle Angelo. Okay. Um, I guess I'm on. <laughs> um, so I'm Angela Piccarillo. I'm the, uh, one of the science research teachers um, of Boston A High School. And uh, I was really thrilled when I was asked to uh, be the moderator for, for tonight's uh, uh, wonderful evening. Um, and uh, just a little bit about uh, what I do. Um, I, um, like I said, I'm, I'm one of the science research teachers uh, of Austin and we have a hundred students in our science research program. And uh, I started it way back in 1998. Um, we have a hundred, uh, approximately 100 solid students in our program. And over the years, we've had so many students form really great relationships at T-Town. Uh, and uh, T-Town is our neighbor, is Austin's neighbor. Um, and uh, when I uh, was invited to do this, uh, particularly on an evening where we're hoping to um, uh, in, inspire uh, the next generation of uh, of people that um, advocate for the environment and particularly people uh, of color, um, I, I had to do it. So um, tonight you guys are going to be hopefully educated, inspired, we get involved. Uh, we'll have a wonderful panel. Um, and what I, I'm gonna ask of all of you is to have, um, after the panel speaks, after our first uh, four speakers, um, speak, then there will be a, a time to ask questions. And I hope that you do. I hope that you ask a lot of questions. And if you have a question for a specific person on the panel, if you can just do that on the chat um, so that we know who I uh, sh should uh, address. Uh, so I think that's enough of me. Um, so I'm going to ask our first panelist to come on. Um, and let me read my notes here. Uh, our first panelist uh, is Victor Medina. Um, and he, this is his own statement. Victor is fortunate enough to have been introduced to careers in environmental science as a teenager. His history comes full circle as he now works to inspire, inspire youth the way he was inspired 13 years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, young people, Mr. Victor Medina. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for that wonderful introduction. Um, so I kind of want to take you on a quick journey uh, to how I got to where I am. Where I am is as a youth program manager working on environmental projects all throughout the tri-state area. So in New York, in New Jersey, um, a lot of them local and, and some a little more regional. Uh, when I'm not working with youth doing some programs, uh, you'll find me usually in the back country of upstate New York, hiking in cold winters, hot summers, climbing, and all of that really kind of boils down to one experience I had when I was 16 years old. Um, but before all of that, I kind of want to give you a background of where I grew up. So I grew up in Washington Heights, New York City to two Dominican parents. Uh, and for me at that time, nature was either agriculture or agriculture. That really was the only green space experience I had. Uh, my family grew up um, on farms in the rural DR, and that was my exposure to it. Um, the idea of these foreign wilderness places really were only just if as best things that you learned about, not places you visited, let alone spent tons of time in. Uh, and that really was gonna change in high school when I started exploring what I wanted to do with my life. So most of the time I would spend my free time either at home, watching TV, playing video games, and I found myself kind of bored after a certain point, kind of antsy uh, in my tweens, if you will. And I looked for an opportunity to do something different. And I remember at one point I had 
kind of had this yearning to like have been a boy scout or have done something like that would have taken me out of New York because I had been there just about most summers or most of the, my vacation times and I wanted something different. But truth be told, um, growing up with two working class parents, we couldn't really afford to send me to do much, whether it be, um, you know, karate or any other or the Boy Scouts or anything like that. So income was a real barrier. Uh, and that's where I got lucky, where I found this program called the uh, LEAF program with the Nature Conservancy that at a, for at a time would take inner city kids and send them out to live on a nature preserve for the entire summer and get paid to do so while covering my living expenses, while um, giving me the chance to uh, providing transportation and having what was gonna become a life-changing experience. All of this to give me an idea of what kinds of jobs there are out there. So it's not a surprise that this huge sort of life-altering experience would change how I would really look at what I wanted to do for a living. And so I told my parents this and both of them having grown up in agriculture made the comment of, I grew up working the hot fields and slaving away so that my child could have the privilege of doing the same thing. No, um, there was a lot of pressure for me as a first generation to be college student, to really become successful. And their idea of success um, was shaped by their upbringing and experiences. So when I went to college, I studied, or I declared my major business. And it took me all of about one semester to change it to economics, to politics. And I found myself kind of lost. I'm spending all this money on a college education having no idea really what I wanted to do. But what I did start noticing is the way that I started spending my free time was different. It was in college that I picked up hiking and backpacking. I started surrounding myself with people that were doing these things more. And it became very clear that I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but I wanted to do something outside. And so, when it came to choose a career path for myself, I started looking at places like maybe working for Nature Conservancy. It's really the only, one of the only places that I had thought about before. Uh, and looking at places like the national parks, which were like these, you know, at the time, these fantasy places that I'm like, oh my God, I've got to get in there, I've got to go. And I thought that these are the positions, these are the, the spaces that I wanted to be in. Um, and let's be honest, the uniform that I wanted to wear, like it looked kind of cool. And as a young guy, I'm like, yeah, that's that's definitely what I want to do. That's the job I want. Uh, and so when I graduated college, I was fortunate enough to land myself a permanent position working uh, at a national historical park. Well, that wasn't exactly what I had wanted, but it was a foot in the door. And it was a stable job and it was a rewarding job. It was kind of a step in the right direction. But something still uh, kind of felt off. Um, and once again, I found myself trying to recapture or trying to capture something that was more than just the title of the position that I was in. Now, in my job at the National Park Service, I spent a lot of time working with the public to appreciate the history behind some of the working class families that lived in this city. Not exactly what I thought it was going to do, but I mean, I well, I knew it was going to do something with history because it was a historical park, but I didn't think that wasn't my focus. It's not what I really wanted. And I thought this was a stepping stone towards something else. And so as I started exploring opportunities to move on up, I started realizing that even though I was in this position that I was sure I wanted, that there was something that I felt that I was not able to contribute. There was something that I really wanted to still get out of my job that would provide me fulfillment. But I didn't want to give up a pension, my great salary, health insurance, job security. It took about four or five years of being in this government job before I realized that I needed opportunity elsewhere. Um, and truth be told, I found myself thinking back to all of these things that I had done in my past and how they've led me to make some of these decisions and some of these experiences that I wouldn't have otherwise had. 
And I think it was really at a backpacking trip out in California where I thought I knew I had to do something that gave people like me the chance to experience where I am right now. And so in 2017, I started working for Groundwork Hudson Valley as their youth program manager, where I get to take kids in Yonkers, students in Yonkers, and introduce them to the same kinds of experiences that forever shaped my childhood and my adulthood. And so uh, the funny story about it is that I wouldn't have ever told you that if you asked me 15, 13 years ago that this one summer was going to set my life in a direction that I would never be able to change, I would have looked at you like you were crazy. But at the end of the day, um, the way that it affected my life wasn't very clear until 10, 13 years later. And it's still not clear how much more of an impact it will have on the way that I choose to live my life uh, going forward. So um, I would encourage you guys all to take a moment to, when you have these experiences, to reflect and kind of know that these things will make sense in the long term. And that for the most part, your decisions that you make, you make them with your gut for reasons that are personal to you and should be true to who you are and what you want. Um, and that's at the end of the day, you're living for you. So thanks for your time and hope you have questions. Angelo, you're muted. Yes, I'm muted. Hello? No, I'm good. I'm good. Hi, Angela. <laughs> hi. Oh, hi, hi Angelo. Sorry. <laughs> hi, how are you? That's Angela White, a big friend of mine. How are you, Angela? How are you? <laughs> I'm good. So, um, so I want to say thank you, Victor. And uh, in terms of questions, um, what we're going to do is we're going to, um, there was a, a time for questions. So we're going to open up uh, that period um, uh, right after uh, Mr. Cunningham speaks, right after Jerome speaks. And then we're going to open up for questions for the entire, for the entire panel. Okay. And again, if I, I will, if I can just remind you that if you have a specific question for uh, a specific panelist, if you can just make sure you label that question as such so that we can identify that. So that was fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, our next panelist, our next speaker uh, is Ms. Fazina Bacchus. Um, and she's an experienced water resource engineer. She's passionate about education and mentoring. So that means I'm gonna be giving you a, um, I'm sending you an email tomorrow morning saying, hey, by the way, you wanna mentor one of my students here last night. Uh, so get ready for that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> conversation and connecting people in nature. So without any further ado, Fazina, it's all yours. Thank you, Angelo. So I want to start off by saying um, that there are many reasons why STEM is great. I think we kind of all know that and we know that there's a shift to get younger folks into this field and being excited about it. Personally, I think STEM is great because what I've been able to do and what a lot of people that I've worked with and have been in the STEM field and I've has done is mold and mesh my studies and take aspects that I enjoy from what I learned throughout high school and college and through my internships and pursue a career that I wanted to wake up to every day and be excited about. And something that not just I could be excited about, but can also make a positive impact on my community. So I'll give you a brief synopsis of like my story and how, how I was able to do that before I go into more of advice for all of you. Um, so you, actually what's interesting is Victor, Jerome and I all went to the same high school and we all went there at the same, around the same time. We were all in different grades. And um, 
we had all done the same internship program at different times. And so what's really cool is that through that, I got an interest in environmental studies. And, um, you know, as we were going to the high school for environmental studies, which is in Manhattan. And um, for me, you know, going to that high school, I kind of didn't know what environmental studies was, but I kind of knew that like climate change and, you know, people's effect on earth and our communities, if we didn't do something about it, like we won't really have the future that we want to have a safe, healthy one for our posterity, right? So I got interested in this field. And then I did this high school internship. Uh, I think it was the summer of my sophomore year. And through that, I had a real world experience. It was my first job. I had never worked an internship before. I never had a paycheck. I didn't even know high school kids could work. And I said, wow, this is, this is great. Um, and in addition to that, I got to like leave my house for a whole summer. And I was, I spent my time in Vermont, which was like, oh, this is appealing. And through that, I learned from other people about environmental studies and what the options for jobs were in the field. But everyone that I worked with was more in like the life sciences. And I thought to myself, well, this is cool, but I'm not sure if I see myself being out in the field. I live in New York City. I'm from Queens. I'm still in Queens right now. There's no like field that I saw in Queens, you know, there's no outdoors place that I could see myself being able to stay where I live, give back to my community and for it to be interesting. And so, you know, I met people along the way. And I, at that point I was looking at colleges junior year and I came across like engineering and the way that people describe engineering to you is problem solving, you know, it's taking um, things like calculus, physics, and chemistry, and all, everything in between, and coming up with like creative solutions to very like human problems, right? And so I took classes, and as you know, in STEM, you learn the basics. You have to take math, you have to take chemistry, physics, and then you take more advanced classes related to your major. And that can be said for pretty much any major out there. You always start with the very basics and then you go into more specialized fields. And so I was not really like thrilled about organic chemistry, right? And so what I did was I said, well, what are my options to pursue environmental engineering? Because at the time in college, I majored in environmental engineering without having to like pursue chemistry. And then I started looking into different options and I realized that engineering and environmental might sound very specific, but it's really broad when you look into it. There's alternative energies, there's water management, there's waste management, there's um, remediation, there's so many different topics. And then I got really excited about water. And I'm not sure if you are all aware of this, but in New York and in Westchester County, um, we get our water from upstate in aqueducts and um, that waters, that land is meant, those watersheds are maintained and they're kept healthy and that land is managed and that water comes filtered naturally um, through aqueducts, like, you know, hundred miles long into New York city. And that's really important. That's where we get all of our drinking water from. And I really was like, that's inspirational. Like the fact that we had, all of this clean water available to us, um, you know, it's, it's really important that like we maintain that infrastructure. And because I got excited about water and making sure that we keep that water clean and we protect our oceans and we protect our watershed and our communities, I took that aspect of it and I decided to pursue that. And so that's specifically what I'm doing. And so, while most STEM careers like mine focus on just the hard sciences, sciences, many actually don't. So you may think that a college major in STEM means your only options are like what, science teacher, researcher, scientist, or engineer, but there's actually like a lot of alternate career paths and that's what makes STEM also appealing in my opinion. So for example, I've had friends in my engineering school that have studied statistics and gone on to pursue jobs in finance. 
I've, I know engineers that, you know, have started off in civil engineering and worked on a lot of construction projects and said, this is cool. I want to be part of the construction industry. Um, and a lot of people who have built things and have decided, well, I want to pursue international development, international development work or go to business. And I have a friend who worked a lot in remediation and brownfields and um, well, pieces of lands that have been contaminated by oil spills and stuff. And she dealt a lot with law. And then she said, I'm passionate about this. Now I want to pursue environmental law. So really like, whether you pursue a traditional alternate route, your STEM experience will help you gain like key skills. And these skills are communication, analytics, organization, attention to detail among others. And so when you're in STEM, you're encouraged to pursue creativity and innovation. And those are like really valuable skills that are sought after in any industry, STEM focused or not. So, STEM is not one of those degrees that will like limit you and there's there's so much that you can do with it. Um, so my advice to you all, whether or not you at this point are STEM ready or not, I think this advice is can be applied universal. And that is to talk to people who are in the career um, you're working towards or a career that you're thinking about. And so these people, whether you're in high school or college, can be you know, your upperclassmen, they could be your professors, your teacher assistants. When you get summer internships, they could be your coworkers. And you wanna to talk to more than one person in order to get a range of perspective. Because when you talk to more than one person, you'll be able to learn that STEM majors provide for a wide job, op or job opportunity, excuse me, and your studies can serve more than one job function. And you wanna really get to know what your options are and yes, you can Google it, but talking to people and getting those real life experiences are, are gonna be beneficial for you. The other thing is you'll learn that there's more than one possible path to get there. Victor mentioned, um, you know, financial setbacks and, you know, having as people of color, I'm also a first generation college student and I'm an immigrant. Um, the understanding that you need to have a paycheck, you need to have job security, these are things that most people sought off for after. And so, you know, you may, if you may not go to college, if that may not be an option for you financially, there's, you know, there's technical trades, there's technical schools, there's other ways, there's fellowships and externships and ways to get to where you want to. And talking to people will help you find out your options. The third thing is talking to people will help you get a real sense of that career as opposed to just, you know, an internet search. And the fourth thing is specifically for engineering, because I'm an engineer, is talking to people who are engineers will help break the stereotypes of how engineers are portrayed. So like, I want you all to just like take 10 seconds, close your eyes and think about like when you see an engineer, like what do you picture them doing? What like chances are you're thinking of them like sitting by a computer, very intensely focused, trying to like solve some equation with calculus or physics. And like, you know, you've got variables and all of those things and it's very um, secluded and you're probably working by yourself and there's a lot of pressure. Um, but like, that has not been my engineering experience. Um, and most of us, we do develop technical skills Yes, that is something we go to school, we learn equations, we learn theories, we learn how to apply them, but we're using all of those things to solve human problems. So engineers work every day to shape the future and make the world better, cleaner, safer. And we mostly focus on, focus on improving social outcomes. For example, I mentioned the wa water infrastructure, having access to clean water, um, making sure our waterways are clean, those are all social issues. They're public health issues. And so, you know, when you think about when you're able to talk to engineers, you get a real sense that it's not as like intimidating as you might think it is. Um, and that can, you know, be, you'll be able to open doors with that. You'll get, you know, fresh perspectives. Um, and lastly, 
um, I wanted to really speak directly to like all of the young women who are tuning in tonight. Um, there's like this metaphor called leaky pipeline, which like describes the way in like women, we all hear about how women are underrepresented, underrepresented minorities in STEM fields, especially in engineering. Um, and there's like many stages in which we quote unquote leak out of the STEM pipeline. Um, and it could be as early as high school and even like years deep into careers. Um, and there's like two things I wanna say regarding this is one, don't get bogged down if your career doesn't end up being focused on the hard sciences. Like I mentioned before, many people end up using their technical skills in important and meaningful ways and just be confident and know that, you know, your STEM education is gonna go a long way. And two, to those of you that, you know, are very passionate about STEM and you know that you wanna pursue engineering, you wanna be a researcher, you wanna work in a certain field like myself when I was entering college, you know, you're planning on sticking it out all the way through, know that it's a marathon and not a sprint, you know, and your passion will keep you going through, you know, all those adversities and you will face obstacles in high school, college and in your career. I'm still facing obstacles right now and I've been working about four, almost five years full time as an engineer. Um, you'll find yourself competing for a place in college, for a summer internship, for a job against, you know, men who will outnumber you, you know, people will not understand the depth of your struggles and, but you should put trust in your experiences and what you've learned. You know, your STEM education, like I said, will, is very meaningful and valuable. So own your story, own your experiences and use it to get to the next step. And the last thing I wanna say, regardless of what you're pursuing, is that you're your best advocate, but that doesn't mean that you have to do it all alone. And I've had many friends, mentors along the way that have continued to support me in and out of my career. So surround yourself with people that will rise you up, not just with word, words of encouragement, but like with also useful advice, because no matter where you are in life, you know, you're gonna need your mentors. You're gonna need people that you can, speak to and that will help you talk through certain situations um and will really make you know a difference in your life and that's all i have to say for now <laughs> all right that was that was great that was so inspiring so uh, eye-opening for a lot of kids i'm sure they're watching uh one thing that um that i, I probably um i like to just piggyback on is the concept of mentoring, you know, how important it is for you to have a friend and for you to have somebody to give you a little bit of guidance. Um, that's awesome. So I'm sure there'll be lots and lots of questions uh, on your way uh, a little later. So our next um, speaker um, is Dr. David Munoz, uh, and he's a researcher and consultant working towards a vision where people and planet can thrive. I can't think of anything better than that. Dr. Munoz. Yeah, thank you, Angelo. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here with you all. I've got, I like looking at pictures. So I've got some pictures together for you. Um, so uh, building off of what Fazina and uh, Victor have been talking about, Right, you where life takes you, you probably can't predict now where you're going to end up. And so, in my own journey in STEM, you know, it's been an adventure. Um, and I've got this picture here of uh, one of my first positions uh, out of college was at Wallkill River National Wildlife Refuge uh, in Sussex, New Jersey. Um, and that's actually the first time I ever interacted with groundwork. So, I'm sort of a groundwork wannabe. Um, but uh, I originally grew up in North Carolina. Um, my family's up from the Chicago area. So uh, I'll be, uh, I'm the out of towner here, but I'm excited to join with you all and share some of my story. So um, just gonna give like a brief timeline of sort of uh, how my path has, has gone and then I'll dig into the details and some lessons learned. So I had four years in college and my degree was environmental science. 
but I didn't always know it was going to be environmental science, uh, and I'll talk about that in a second. After I graduated, uh, I spent a year uh, sort of adventuring and working seasonal jobs uh, at different places on the East Coast, uh, New Jersey, Virginia, um, and Ohio. And then I started my graduate degree. And so if, when I was in high school, I didn't really know what a graduate degree was. So if you're a high schooler who's in that boat too, essentially it means you uh, go and get some advanced training uh, in a different uh, specific area. So for instance, I got advanced training uh, in my master's degree in wildlife science. And then I went and got a PhD um, in ecology where I learned how to do research in ecology, trying to understand how things like uh, growing cities or climate change um, impact uh, the organisms and ecosystems around us. So what's happening with our plants and animals? And one thing that I wanna just toss in there that um, I also wouldn't have known in high school is that for a lot of this, um, there's opportunities where you can get paid to develop your own skills, to learn, to grow as both uh, a scientist, if that's the uh, career you pursue. But in college, uh, there was work that I was able to do where I could get paid to do research for different faculty. And so I learned what it meant to do science, how it all worked. And then even in my schooling, uh, my master's degree and my PhD, um, depending on what types of programs you go into, you can actually be paid to be a student, which is, which is pretty awesome and helps make uh, making that life decision a little bit easier. So what did that lead to? So my role now, uh, I work part-time at Penn State University as a researcher and equity specialist. But then my other uh, part-time job is my consulting business that uh, I just started last year. And so really for me, what I love about the work that I get to do is uh, working towards this vision, right? So I've, I'm trained as a scientist. So I know statistics, I know um, how uh, our ecosystems work and I can apply that in the conservation field. Through my training as well, uh, I also, uh, focus on equity and justice and teaching and mentoring. And that's sort of how I uh, approach the community aspect of my work uh, that I really care about. And then finally, uh, this collaboration aspect where uh, I use these different skills such as leadership, coordination, communication uh, to work towards the, the vision that I have uh, for the world around us where we can all thrive. And so I'm really pleased with how my science journey or it has led me so far, and I don't even know where it's going to take me next. Um, but it's been fun to be guided by my own values and have the training that's let me uh, achieve the goals that I've wanted. So let's rewind a bit. Uh, I tried to find a picture of myself from high school where I didn't look like a buffoon. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, there weren't many to choose from. So here's me back in the high school days. Uh, when I think back about my high school time, I didn't really know exactly where I wanted to go with things. Um, I remember my parents saying, you know, David, you don't have to go to college. You can take some time to figure things out. Um, there's lots of opportunities out there. Uh, I also remember after finishing high school, I, I remember telling my parents, like, I never want to do science or math again. They're just like, not for me. It's not my strong suit. Uh, I want to. I want to look into different things. And so it's funny that this is the only nice picture I can find from high school, because it's me standing next to my math teacher and my environmental science teacher, who both, uh, you know, gave me the foundation for what I'm doing uh, in my career today. So as I said, and as uh, the others have said in the panel so far, you never know where you're going to end up. And so uh, just hammering this home, you know, like international studies was the first thing I wanted to do when uh, I went to college. I was like, you know, I want to go see new places. I want to travel. And I wanted to try and figure out like, how can we make the world a better place for everyone? And uh, through different opportunities, I got to go to Morocco and teach English uh, for a few weeks. There's me in the bottom left uh, with uh, my host family and a colleague. I also got to go to Costa Rica, um, 
which is my first time uh, like ever seeing a tropical rainforest that wasn't like on TV or the Discovery Channel. Uh, and that was just such a cool experience. But as I was uh, doing my international studies degree, I felt like there was an itch that wasn't being scratched and I, I couldn't quite figure it out. And that's when I had to take a class uh, in wildlife conservation. This was, so in college, there's things called gen education, your general education requirements, where you have to take classes in fields that uh, you might not necessarily think you would want to take a class in. And so this was me taking that science class that I was so resistant against. Um, but taking that class totally changed the direction of where I was going. So the teacher there, Joshua Kopfer, here he is standing to the left of me. Uh, he uh, noticed how interested I was in the course. He was like, hey, like, you seem really interested in this uh, and you're a good student. Like, would you like to come out and do research with me? And I didn't know what that meant, but it seemed like a really cool opportunity. And through getting to work with him, he exposed me to how scientists understand what animals do in the world around them. So there's me holding a snake. Uh, you can't tell, but there's fear in my eyes. I don't think I would have ever expected growing up holding up snakes. Um, that always seemed to be something that was on like National Geographic or Discovery. But being able to uh, connect with another live animal was like life changing. Uh, and that changed my whole career. And by doing research, that's also where I realized where, you know, science is different than I thought it was. When I was growing up, it felt like my science classes were about memorizing facts. And instead, what I realized is science is more about discovery, like learning something new, gaining the tools to figure something out that other people haven't figured out before. Um, as Fizina said, it's a, that problem solving, learning how to do new things. And so I switched to environmental science. And uh, in that degree, I got to learn more closely, you know, how the environment around us is crucial to our well being. And science gave me a lot of different tools, uh, statistics, um, the scientific method, uh, some really good technical expertise that gave me ways to learn how to improve the livelihoods for the communities uh, that I'm a part of. And uh, so like one project I gotta do is this vehicle that you see in the background, this solar panel, this solar powered bicycle, me and four other students, uh, did some fundraising, learned how to build uh, this solar energy bike uh, and got to use the money we raised um, to help with science education uh, and our local community. And so it's super cool. I got to build a vehicle. I, how did, I would never have been able to predict I'd, I'd do that in my life. And catapulting from this experience in college, uh, that led me down the road um, in my scientific studies and my master's and PhD and then my jobs learning how, you know, how does the world around us, how do these critters that you see here, whether it's a bobcat or a turtle or a mouse uh, or a salamander, how do all these critters adapt to the world around them? And can we make a world where both wildlife can thrive, where people can thrive? Um, and uh, how can we achieve those things? So uh, I got, I've gotten to see a lot of cool things uh, in my career so far. I've gotten to discover new places, which was really important for me. Uh, and I've gained the skill set now that where my role at Penn State and in my consulting business, um, I can start to address the problems uh, that I think are important uh, for the communities that uh, I'm a part of and that I value. And so thinking about some lessons learned from uh, this uh, windy journey that I've been on so far is one, uh, you know, talk to your teachers, talk to your professors when you go to college, you know, they're there to help you find opportunities. I was lucky that a professor, you know, asked me if I wanted to pursue an opportunity, because I'm not sure I would have known research was one. But, you know, getting to a university, you know, they can pay you as an undergraduate to learn how to conduct research. You can do it as a summer job. You can do it as a job during the semester. And that helps you, you know, for me, that helped me learn what discovery was and how science actually worked. 
So for instance, part of this discovery process, one of my summer jobs is I got to work with dogs that are trained to find turtles. And we used the, these dogs to understand how a new park going into the local area would benefit local turtle populations. And so super fun. You essentially get to chase dogs through the forest. They bring you turtles and you get to do science and discover new things about the places right around the corner from you. So another lesson that was really important for me is learning how to build a community where you can be yourself. So whether it is an undergraduate student in college or especially uh, once I was a graduate student. Um, so there's an organization here that I mentioned, SACNIS, Advancing Chicanos and Native Americans in the Sciences. Um, you know, not every place you go is going to understand your background, um, maybe the struggles that you faced maybe the struggles that your communities face or that your family has had to go through. Um, and that can be really hard. It can feel kind of isolating. Um, and so it's really important that uh, you know that wherever you go, some of these communities exist and you can find them and connect with them um, because that's really where you can thrive. So build a community where you can be yourself. And then lastly, as others have mentioned, uh, you know, find mentors who care about your success. So I was really lucky that my professor, Dr. Kopfer, really cared about me doing well, and he had invested a lot of time and energy uh, into my education, uh, into training me as a researcher, uh, inviting me to Wisconsin, which is this picture here, um, to go catch timber rattlesnakes. This was after he moved. But also mentors don't only have to be people older than you. Uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Rondi Malik, uh, Dr. Courtney Davis and Stacey Ambergy, uh, Neha Savant, you know, these were all peers who helped guide me. And, you know, we all strategized together on, you know, how to advance our careers, how to make the connections we needed to be successful. And so finding mentors and peers who care about you doing well uh, will not only help you discover the opportunities you need, but will help keep you going when times get tough. And so uh, just to close out my brief little story here, just thinking about things that I wish I knew when I was in high school. Um, there's some programs that you can look into. So the McNair Scholars Program is at universities across the country. And this helps give you uh, direct mentoring uh, and support when you go to college. It provides you funding uh, to pay for your tuition, and it helps get you research opportunities within STEM uh, to grow your skills and to learn more. Uh, while you're in high school, there's things like college access programs or Upward Bound, which uh, connect you to different colleges and universities uh, and give you some really cool experiences. So in fact, uh, speaking about those turtle finding dogs, that was a program that I participated in with high schoolers from uh, the local North Carolina community. So you can see them there on the right. And so while uh, I was learning how to do research, I also got to work with these students and expose them to how uh, environmental research was being done. And that was all part of a college access program uh, at the local university. And we need you. Uh, everyone from all different backgrounds and skills, uh, we need your help, whether you're interested in art or business or uh, building websites or making videos. Um, you know, there's, there's a role for everyone in the environmental field. And I think what's really exciting about being in the environmental field is there's chances to discover, there's chances to grow as an individual, learn new things, uh, and it's meaningful work. Um, you really can connect what you're doing uh, to the values that you may have. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll pass on the torch to Jerome, um, but thank you all. I'm excited to hear some of your questions. Okay, so before um, I introduce uh, Jerome, um, that, was, that was great. Um, he took us through, a, through the whole um, journey, an entire journey, and he touched upon so many things. Um, one thing that, that I can maybe have the kids think about that are in the audience are, is what you said about everyone having a role in the environment. Everybody can make a contribution. So those of you guys thinking about um, helping environmental causes, you don't necessarily have to be an environmental science major. 
to help out. So our next uh, speaker, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say about uh, operations and, and grants. Um, he says uh, his story has, has some interesting twists and turns over the years, but it has caused him to develop a well-rounded, him to develop as a well-rounded professional. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jerome Cunningham. Thank you indeed, Angelo. Um, I would like to... All right, all good? Good indeed. All right, uh, so I would like to thank T-Town Lake Reservation for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, thank you, Angelo. And um, as he mentioned, my name is Jerome Cunningham. I am the Development and Communications Associate at Groundwork Hudson Valley. Uh, and I have a BA in communications with a focus in advertising and public relations from the City College of New York. Now, a lot of folks were talking about uh, non-traditional paths and stems, like how did you get here? It's like, is this communication? So I'd like to first start out by saying that ever since I was a kid, I was an explorer. I constantly, wandered off, got lost in grocery stores and theme parks, things of that nature, just because I wanted to experience things. Uh, and so in that, I suppose our story could, for lack of a better term, officially start in junior high school where I had my very first job and that was watering plants at my old school in junior high. Uh, I would go to the school and water the plants in the morning. And the way in which I did that, because at the time during the summer, minors weren't allowed into the school unless they were part of the day camp. So the way in which I was able to do this was to actually be a day camper. I would do the, the gardening in the morning and then the payment that I would have otherwise had in my pocket went straight to the, the day camp. And so I realized that I realized later on in life that I put myself through day camp and I'm starting an environmental career and I don't even realize it. So in any case, I graduate from junior high school and attended the, the high school for environmental studies. And what's interesting about my story is that isn't where I applied. I was aiming to go to another school and it just didn't open. It was gonna be a brand new school and it just hadn't opened. And the reason I mentioned this is because my story didn't lead me to environmental studies high school because I wanted to be a marine biologist or be in science, but I would eventually be led there uh, to some degree uh, through the internships program that I did, uh, being out in the Pocono Mountains and uh, do, working on checking out prescribed burns and things of that nature. And after having done so, even though I was still in high school, I thought, well, didn't really have a concept of green careers, but after this, it's not entirely out of the question. But I wanted to for lack of a better term, explore some more. So I continued to do internships throughout college. Uh, my first one was doing ecological management and I got to explore in Rochester, New York. Uh, a lot of the work dealt with habitat, deer habitat surveying. And uh, I even got a chance to do a little bit of birding. So that was pretty fun. I, I did another internship that led me to Charleston, South Carolina, doing preserve education. I got my hands on some GIS and mapping and uh, doing invasive removal. And all of a sudden I find myself quite a long way from watering a garden in the back of my junior high school. This is starting to feel like concrete stuff. It's starting to feel like I can build a career out of this. But I had an epiphany and that was I didn't quite want to be a scientist. Still wanted to work in the STEM field, but not do the hard sciences. 
So how is that going to happen? I, how could one reconcile that sort of thing? I had to reevaluate my strengths and my interests. And from there, I did the prerequisite work necessary to become an advertising and public relations major at the City College of New York. And so I did some more exploring there and I ended up getting two internships after that related to uh, marketing. And one of which was a really sweet deal because um, I needed an internship uh, in my major. So it counted not only as college credit, but I got paid for it and I was able to put it on my resume and have that as an experience. So that was a super sweet deal. And I took on tasks related to social media, copywriting and outreach. So I'm putting my fingers on a lot of different skills here. And then another path opens up um, in, in the philanthropy world, in the fundraising world, where I currently am now, but we'll get to that a little later. But in that I was a philanthropy assistant part-time. I was doing database management and donor research and reporting, things of that nature. And it was my first time being in school and working at the same time. I had done these other internships before, but it was during like school breaks and everything. This, I was actively taking classes and doing uh, this part-time position. And so it's time for me to graduate and go out into the real world. And what do I do? You guessed it, I grabbed another internship. And so that one was in donor engagement. And I ended up putting my hands into graphic design and copy editing, uh, things of that nature. So I was able to do a very wide variety of functions prior to what would be my first job out of college. And that was as a youth engagement coordinator, uh, as a youth engagement grant coordinator, excuse me. I was able to provide and serve youth on the same path that I was on. Uh, and now in the position that I'm at with Groundwork Hudson Valley, I'm not only able to support um, the youth engagement programs there, but all of the other programming uh, through the fundraising and marketing strategies that we develop here. And so in this exploration, I, I had to take away some things and really evaluate and learn uh, what it took to be, for lack of a better term, successful or stay on, the, on this particular path. And the three things that I had come up with was to do the work, to network, and to use my voice. And so the first one, doing the work. As you heard, I had a whole bunch of different internships, but I wouldn't have known the path that I wanted to go on had I not done the work, had I not gone out and explored um, and checked out different things. Like in these different uh, fields of study, I saw what it took to work in them full time. I uh, talked to people who were working in it full time and that'll come up a little later with using your network. I uh, researched the credentials I needed to work full-time in that field and make a career out of it. And so that was the work that I needed to do. And, uh, and I interned a lot. I had to, um, by the time I had graduated, I had built up my resume and a, I had, a, again, a bunch of different skills. And that proved to be, that proved to make me a very competitive candidate across uh, just about any field of study. And uh, next is networking, which is connecting with folks to the fields that you're interested in. Um, a, you're, for those who are in school, keeping connected with your teachers, um, going to resource centers if you have them, uh, getting remaining connected to professors. And when you do internships, being connected to your previous managers, you know, uh, cultivate those relationships and invest in them uh, and they'll vouch for you. That'll be uh, good in terms of the backup you need when you're going out and uh, looking for different opportunities. But the last one is to use your voice. And I left that one last because that's the one that essentially wraps those two up. Um, 
your network won't always be around. Uh, you, you can have great mentorship and uh, that's very necessary and it's very important, um, but they won't always be around to vouch for you. And when you do the work, you'll have your resume and uh, things of that nature. And it'll probably look great and polished, but it doesn't tell the whole story. The thing that truly uh, um, wraps it all up and seals the deal is when you speak up for yourself. The, the fact of the matter is like when, when you get into these rooms, there's the person you're in the room with, the opportunity. And so now what you have to do to get to that opportunity is stick in there and use your own voice, speaking up for yourself. Uh, no one knows what you want unless you say something. Uh, I would say that those three things were uh, very, very helpful for me. And um, yeah, I would encourage you all to do the same. Uh, keep exploring, stay curious, and thank you so much for this opportunity. Okay. That was great. Thank you so much. That takes a lot of twists and turns. That was awesome. Uh, so now um, we're going to enter the uh, questions uh, and answers phase of the program. Um, so this will be an opportunity for people to uh, send their questions in. Okay. Um, I do have um, a bunch here. Um, so why don't we go to, uh, one, this, this goes to everyone on the panel. So everyone on the panel can, can feel free to, uh, provide feedback. Uh, how can we support students of color pursue environmental careers through STEM? Some parents aren't supportive of environmental careers and pressure their kids to pursue careers in healthcare, law, banking or careers that are considered common academic majors in college? So I guess I could uh, answer that from, from an angle. Um, and uh, I think I, from my personal experience kind of working with youth and their exploring careers, uh, I like to talk about this from how you communicate with parents about that and how you communicate sort of with youth about that. Because there's going to be um, kind of a, a pull from parents who are concerned about the financial stability, which is really, really valid. Um, bearing in mind that regardless of whatever field you're looking at, we're training our students for jobs or for a job market that isn't what it is today. It's going to be very different from what it is today. Uh, and that's, I think, an important point to highlight that there is that degree of uncertainty, um, which may sound like a double edged sword. It's like, uh, you don't know. But at the same time, it opens up that conversation of opportunities and possibilities. And it's showcasing that that these are the kinds of jobs um, and career paths that are well paying, that are uh, fulfilling, that you can potentially have. Because most parents don't really know um, what these jobs are. Uh, and I think an important thing, it's important to sort of for from their end to know that this is the, these are jobs that are out there. Uh, it's also important to be mindful of kind of cultural sensitivity. So when I told my parents that I wanted to be a park ranger, their first reaction was yogi, because that's the only experience they have with park rangers. Um, and you think about it, there's really no way directly to translate park ranger into Spanish, which is what they spoke. And so being sensitive to that and kind of trying to think about ways that you're explaining what these kinds of career opportunities and jobs are and kind of assuring them that they are there is one thing. Um, you'll not necessarily convince parents to say, yes, now I want my child to go into this field. Um, I think parents at the end of the day, you know, have the well-being of their child in mind. Uh, from a student's end, um, really, I go, I go back and forth with telling people, pursue what you want and kind of be real with about your financial needs and securities. Because like I said, I had to go through the same things and we all have to struggle and answer um, those questions. And I think usually the piece of advice that I give um, and that I live by is telling you that, you know what, especially when you're getting out and starting your career, you may not make the most money that as much money as you thought you would, right? But tomorrow you can get another job and make more money. And the day after that, you can get another job that makes more money. But what you're never going to make is more time. And I think that thinking through that lens, 
that the time that you have is finite and that what you want to do has to be truly for you, that the your time you're spending is your time and only yours, um, kind of, can get to, I think, puts students in a mindset to think about what they really want versus what all of these other external uh, needs that are kind of real um, and constantly pressing down on them, uh, you know, are, are present. So it's really boils down to showing people that there are jobs out there and that the uh, the variety, I think that's the, a big key, that it's not just being in the field um, or working in a certain very narrow spectrum of environmental science, but showing the breadth of experiences that are out there uh, and really challenging people to think about what it is that's gonna provide them fulfillment um, aside from those noises so that they can find for themselves the path they wanna go on. Would anybody like to add? Yeah, I would just add by saying that um, when I was applying to high schools in New York City, um, back when I had started at that point, you could apply to any high school you wanted in the five boroughs. And a lot of our high schools are very specialized. And um, at that time, my dad said, you should go into business. Like, I, I know I know accountants, they, they do our taxes every year and they seem to make a lot of money. You know, that that could be a good place for you. And I had applied to the high school for economics and finance and I didn't get in. And um, I had applied to other high schools too, based on just like, based on um, math, like the opportunity for like math courses. Cause I liked math back then and um, came to the high school for environmental studies and then took some environmental classes, took my AP classes, stuff that I was interested in. And then you know, at that point, like Bridget was posting about this internship program. And um, I was like, this is a cool opportunity. Like I've never worked in internship. I'm sitting around all summer and I'm watching TV. So, um, you know, this doing something is better than doing nothing, right? So I got this internship and I think that also was kind of like, the stepping point for my dad because he saw that like when I came back I was like passionate about what I was doing for the first time I was like hey I'm doing like I'm pursuing an in environmental field like I've learned so much I did my research I started doing stuff like finding more answers and then I was like I think environmental engineering is like where I want to go and um at that point because my dad saw me do this internship, realized that you can get a job in this field was supportive. Um, and I think for parents who are skeptical of their kids going into environmental field, realize that as the world's population grow, climate change, renewable, non-renewable energy is dwindling. We're facing big challenges. And we need young people to step up and provide creative solutions. And there's always going to be a job market in the environmental field because, you know, there's always going to be problems that humans create that we all have to come together to solve. And so, you know, parents might think like now this is what's hot, but you have to think about five, 10 years from now. And like I said, working in water resources, water is clean water is you know a finite resource once we use our clean water and we dirty it i mean we can clean it again but that's it you know um so investing in those technologies because once we you know use all of our clean water then what you know we need creative solutions um and that's sort of what inspired me to to pursue what i'm doing and there's always opportunity and and that's the like beautiful thing i think about the environmental field um, and I think the second thing is um, if students are interested in an internship, um, uh, you know, encouraging parents, like Bridget had to talk to my dad actually to, to convince him to be like, hey, you know, you should let your daughter pursue this opportunity. He was a little bit adamant about me leaving for like a summer, but seeing that and realizing you could get paid in this field, you know, was like, you know, the point where his eyes opened up and he realized like, yes, like, you know, this is something you're happy about. And, and obviously there are, there's potential in this field, um, go for it. So that's, that's my two cents. 
Okay, um, while I have you on here, maybe I, you can add three cents. Uh, there was another, <laughs> there, there's one question that um, is very specific to you. Okay. Um, and I, I really like to, you know, um, it says, um, how can we uh, best advocate? Uh, and I apologize because the, the uh, chats come in and then it moves. Um, um, here we go. Um, we'll be very curious to hear about your current job. Um, did you ever face any challenges, uh, stereotypes, uh, being a woman in the engineering field and also, um, uh, a woman of color? Yeah. Um, so just to quickly summarize what I do right now, like I said, environmental engineering focuses on many dif different aspects of the environment from alternative energy to conservation, to water management, and I, and I chose water management. So being in New York City, I mentioned, um, there's a lot of aspects that we deal with with water, right? Like you guys have maybe remember, I'm not sure how many years ago this was at this point, maybe like almost 10, but when we had Hurricane Sandy, right? And that affected a lot of our coastline in New York City, right? And you remember hearing about how uh, roads and homes and hospitals and so many, so many places got flooded and there was storm surge and power went out and all of these things. And so one of the things that I had initially started working on in my career was looking at flood protection, which falls into climate change. You know, this is not something that New York City, we really focused on before because we're like, well, we're all the way in the Northeast. Like why would we really, really care about hurricanes, right? And if you look at like where hurricanes are now and how frequently they are, and if you think about all of our rainy days and how much water we get, and sometimes you'll step out and you'll say, you know, like our streets are flooded. You know, I'm trying to cross the street in this corner and this like entire corner is flooded. I, one of the things I look at is how do we reduce flooding, right? And so um, stormwater management is one of those aspects of water. And so I work on a lot of projects right now um, where we introduce green infrastructure to cities, um, to the five boroughs. And by that, we design bioswales, we design underground um, control structures that will help uh, reduce flood, um, help alleviate street flooding in our communities. Um, and typically a lot of those communities that were designed sort of not really thinking about those things are more like the outer boroughs of this city where are not as funded as like Manhattan is. And so we get a lot of floodings and typically they're neglected because people of color live there. And then, you know, it's like, we have all these issues and like, who's, who's doing something for us? You know, and it's like, I live in the outer borough of Queens. I live all the way by like JFK airport. So, um, you know, that sort of inspired me as a person of color to be like, hey, I'm gonna give back to my community. And this is an opportunity for me. So when I design things, when I decide like what projects I wanna work on, I think about like what community is being served? How are they being served? Um, what, you know, what's, what is there an opportunity for me to educate people? Cause sometimes, you know, when we're building like this, what this flood control structure, we were looking at building a flood wall in Coney Island. People who were living in Coney Island said, I don't want a flood wall there. I won't be able to enjoy, I won't be able to access the boardwalk. And so um, being an engineer, uh, in a way, I'm also like, you know, this pseudo like educator, I attend community, meet community meetings as an engineer. And I take the time to sit people down and be like, hey, what, what are your reservations about this? What are you unsure about? And let me help you get to what my perspective is and also help you understand that like what we're deciding, what we're, what we're proposing to be done in your community is, is beneficial. And so I get a lot of opportunities to speak to other people of color in my job, to speak to people in New York City um, about, about that. Um, as for specific um, roadblocks that I've come across as a woman in STEM, I mentioned before, and I said my words carefully, which is um, 
you know, when you decide to stick it out, you're going to face obstacles like all along the way. They just, they don't, they don't ever end. And I think for most people in most careers, when you have the drive to like rise up, do more, get that promotion, um, get a pay raise, whatever it is, you're always going to have to like push, push barriers, right? Um, so not just in STEM, not just as a woman, not just as a person of color, I think anybody, but more so we experience it. Um, and so, you know, it was like, I went to an engineering school in college. So imagine like me saying like, we have a handful of internships available in college and I've got, um, you know, male students, I've got people who have been to their entire family has gone to college. They have mentors, they have private tutors, they have like all of these resources and I'm competing for the same internship against them, right? And I think what I mentioned before is that you should trust in your education and trust in your where you've got accomplished and what you know where you are because you're sticking it out just as much as that other person that may have had all of those resources to get to where they got to and you're you're in that room and you're sitting alongside them and they're your peer and that's that speaks volumes and so um i think in those moments when you feel like there are roadblocks like I said, turning to mentors and helping them guide you through it. Um, and I mentioned like one, one thing I kind of didn't really touch on, and this is maybe a little bit of tangent, but I do want to mention this is um, when I was in college, I thought a mentor had to be somebody who was like mid-career, like 10, 15 years into their career, accomplished, knew what they were doing and like made it, quote unquote. And then I realized that a lot of those people you don't really have access to talking to they might be busy doing other things in their life. I may not want to mentor you. And, and that's okay. Um, not everybody wants to mentor. Um, but one of the things I realized is that there are like upperclassmen. There were, when I was an undergrad, there are master's level students going at your college too. There are teacher assistants who are current PhD. They're currently produce, you know, pursuing their PhDs. There, when you get a summer internship, you're going to work at a company, you're going to work with an organization, and there are going to be recent graduates there, and you know, you're going to be working alongside those people. So take advantage of all of those opportunities that you have with all of these people that are going to be with you to ask those questions and, and you know, to get them to open up to you and share their experiences because though having those conversations with those people were more valuable than like for me to talk to like some person at a conference who was 15 years into their career and had a PhD for like five minutes, you know, and, and feeling the pressure of like, do I really want to ask this question? This question might seem dumb. Like, I don't know. But if you are working alongside people, if you're seeing them every day, you're seeing your teacher assistant every day or your professor or master students or whatever, um, you kind of can build that confidence and feel more open to asking them. And, you should definitely, you know, pursue those questions and, and, you know, go for it. Um, Dr. Um, um, Becky Ziegler, I need your uh, input here for a moment. Um, we are a little bit behind in terms of our schedule. Do we have time for one more question? Or yeah, I think we'll do one more question and then we'll have to move along. But what I'm going to do is take all of the questions and put them into a, a like Word document and send them to the panelists. And if you have specific questions for um, any of these panelists, I'll forward them independently and they may or may not respond if they have time. So um, send me a direct message to the T-Town Lake Reservation and I'll compile them all and I'll also save the chat so we can make sure that if if they have time and want to respond that they can do that. And do you want, do you still want to do the five minute break or do we want to- No, go we're going to we're gonna skip the break because unfortunately we're behind and I don't want to keep people too long. But um, right. I, I so do we'll, want, if there's one more question, I thought there were a couple of generic really good ones, Angelo, if there's any you want to add or we can move on. Well, there was one uh, that was, um, to me, uh, a good one. It was addressed to David, but I think um, you know others can can provide your input. And that is, um, what ways would you recommend uh, to get younger students um, 
to discover um, their passion for STEM? What, what are some of the avenues that you suggest for students that um, may have the inclination for STEM or would like that extra you know, support to get involved in STEM, particularly students of color? Yeah, well, um, so actually, I, I answered that question a little bit in the chat. And so I think I'll, I'll yield my time um, to see if any of the other panelists have something you want to add to that question. I think, yeah, I think I can add a little, uh, my two cents just uh, very quickly. I think in terms of getting people to discover for themselves, the biggest obstacle I think that we often find when we're as, uh, as educators doing that is we're like, look, it's STEM, it's good, it's fun. Um, and we just kind of tend to have this, like we have to, we, we try to push this on them. And I think that looking at it from, from my angle as a program manager, I try not to tell people that this is what they have to do or this is what they should do, but create a space for self-discovery. Um, and so when we're talking about engaging in either STEM activities or STEM projects or STEM themed trips, uh, it's letting people kind of for themselves find what it is that they're connecting to and kind of drawing from that. So I guess a simple example is I think about when I, you know, done camping trips or what have you, what I think is cool about the space that we're camping in may not be what everybody else does. Um, but letting people find out for themselves, whether it be the, the, the landscape or the wildlife or what have you that they connect to, that's kind of where I think the magic um, kind of happens. So, you know, there's no way that we as educators can, um, can really predict how these experiences are going to affect their lives and whether or not it will mean a, a career directly in STEM. And I think that, and maybe Jerome, if you want to kind of shoot your two cents into this, that consciousness that it's created ultimately informs how the direction your career goes and the way your lifestyle goes. For, like I said, for me, it wasn't immediately, I'm going to do this job. It's, I'm going to explore these kinds of places, the you know national parks, go hiking, backpacking, climbing, et cetera. So it's important to be mindful of that when we're, we're thinking about giving students the opportunity to explore um, and that's the key word is to explore, not to follow the dotted path that we uh, want them to follow, because uh, you don't know how it's going to uh, affect them. So that would be, I said, creating that space for them to figure it out and create that consciousness. And the bare minimum um, that you'll result is that they are at least aware of these issues and that informs the decisions they make, hopefully in the careers they go. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll be really quick, but... Um, yeah, it's very much like Victor said, exploring and having those options open. Like, again, for me, I, I didn't have a concept of it until I was exposed to it. And upon being exposed to it, I wanted to explore it some more. And like, to, to a certain degree, uh, maybe it's just perhaps from the school of thinking that I'm from, but uh, I believe to a certain extent we, as just children of the earth, as uh, residents of this planet, we all, for lack of a better term, have a stake in STEM nonetheless, um, just as human beings. And when we put our hands in the dirt, when we uh, allow the sun to shine on our face, like we're experiencing all of these things. Awesome. Um, so just to, just to reiterate, we're going to skip the break um, and we're going directly to our first keynote speaker of the evening. Uh, and there are two. Uh, and we'll hold off the questions after the second keynote. So our first keynote speaker um, is uh, Bridget Griswold uh, from Groundwork Hudson Valley. Uh, and as executive director of Groundwork, um, Bridget oversees the organization's efforts to create sustainable environmental change in Yonkers through community-based partnerships that promote equity, youth leadership, and economic opportunity. Prior to joining Groundwork, Bridget was the director of youth engagement programs 
for the Nature Conservancy, where she managed all education, volunteer, and employment programs for young people. Screenwalt is all yours. Take over. Thank you. I just want to join um, all of our panelists in thanking T Town um, for hosting this amazing event. Um, I can't tell you how inspired I am by all of the panelists and your stories and journeys in the many various ways you're making contributions to our planet. So thank you. I will be brief. Um, and I was asked to join this panel um, to share a little bit, um, not so much about advice to the high school students that are here on this Zoom meeting tonight, but more so um, directed at the environmental professionals of, of the environmental groups that may be tuning in tonight about ways that environmental organizations can help support more young people of color um, to access and have opportunity within the environmental field. So. I've been doing this work now for um, 17 years, 13 years at the Nature Conservancy, where I built a, our Career Pathways program specifically for urban youth to have access and opportunities in the environmental field. And most recently, the past four years at Groundwork Hudson Valley, working with Victor and Jerome um, and others here on the panel um, to think about and employ tactics to help make the environmental movement more diverse and inclusive. Um, so in those 17 years, um, I feel there have emerged four giant barriers that I think we in the environmental community and amongst environmental pro professionals that have, um, that are in positions of power to make changes within our systems and procedures, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity for us to hold hands together to continue to ensure that the environmental movement and the environmental sector is, is more equitable and just than it has historically been. Um, so I'm not gonna be super inspiring. I'm gonna be, um, I'm gonna be the person that, that um, speaks about what we need to do more of and why we need to do more of it. Um, so in my 17 years, I've landed on four giant barriers for, um, uh, communities of color and um, increasing diversity in the environmental movement. The first is really we as an environmental community have done a terrible job at public relations and marketing and communicating about environmental career fields as viable career paths for young people. Um, and so I think that is one major issue. Uh, Victor spoke on this, Fazina spoke on this, David spoke on this. This was a common theme that really emerged amongst all the panelists tonight was this idea that the environmental career field is not a viable career path. When in reality, there are a lot of great good paying jobs in the environmental field. Um, but we as a sector have not done a good job at promoting those um, careers. If you look at environmental magazines, um, outdoor enthusiast magazines, and you look at the images of people that are portrayed on the covers of those magazines, they are predominantly white folks. Um, so I think we have a challenge um, in our movement, in our sector to promote those stories of young people and communities of color out there doing environmental things. Because if you're a young person, and if you are, you know, regardless of your race, if you only see one race represented in a particular job sector, you're not gonna see yourself in that job sector. So I think we really need to focus on our public relations, our marketing, making sure that young people know that there are viable career paths out there and um, illustrating and showing examples of professionals of color like many people on this panel that are actively in the field and making a difference. I think that goes a long way and it goes back to that basic saying that representation matters. Second barrier that I think we need to overcome as an environmental sector is around financial uh, barriers. 
uh, many of the panelists mentioned today about, I didn't know I could get paid to do this work. Um, and there are, a there, there are a tremendous number of paid internships and early career exposure opportunities for young people in the field. Um, but there are also a tremendous number of opportunities for young people to advance in the environmental field through unpaid internships. And we perpetuate a problem by doing that um, as an environmental sector, because what that means is that only the people that can afford to have unpaid internships are going to get exposed to our field. So I really think we need to spend some time thinking about how to get past providing unpaid internships and assuring that all of our internship opportunities that we make available as a sector, as an industry, are paid. Um, there are also financial barriers for young people at the collegiate level pursuing this field. So thinking about scholarship opportunities um, and being able to support young people to pursue these degrees in college and beyond is something that we as a sector really need to focus on getting better at. The third challenge that I think we need to address as a sector is around infrastructure. Many of the folks here on the panel spoke about that in terms of the windy path and the leaky pipeline, right? If you look at the finance industry or corporate America, there are programs that exist. One that's been around for many, many years is a program called Inroads which basically helps to advance opportunities for young people of color to enter the finance world. Starts with as early as middle school, gives you exposure to the finance industry. In high school, gives you a paid internship. As long as you're doing well in that paid internship in high school, you'll get a paid internship at college. As long as you do well in that paid internship in college, there will be a finance job waiting for you at the end of your college degree. Nothing like that exists in the environmental field. And I really think that the environmental community needs something like this. We need the infrastructure to be able to support young people in whatever environmental career path they choose to decide to pursue. And what we need to do in order to make something like that is hold hands amongst environmental organizations and really think about not only mentoring young people, but essentially sponsoring young people. By that, I mean, we in environmental groups all have our youth programs. Um, Kevin talked a lot about the T-Town, um, all of the great K through 12 environmental education experiences. We have a great program at Groundwork Cuts and Valley for teenagers. Um, if we can collectively hold hands and not necessarily promote our programs per se, but promote the individuals within those programs, um, that, is ultimately, I think, taking mentorship to the next level. A term I like to call sponsorship, which means you promote your people and the students that pass through these programs more than you promote your programs. So if I have a young person that comes up through my green team in Groundwell Cuts and Valley, who ultimately goes on to work at a seasonal job in college at T-Town, who ultimately then goes to get a full-time job at um, Westchester Land Trust, that's a win. I count that as a win. It's not necessarily about the organization, but about ensuring and investing in the individual success of the young people that come through our programs. The fourth and final thing, which I will uh, say is probably going to be the hardest thing for environmental organizations to grapple with, is around the issue of culture change. And as we work to promote all these opportunities for young folks of color or low income students to find full time jobs and opportunities within the conservation and the environmental field, we need to be sure that we are creating opportunities that allow those young people to continue to grow. So we're not talking about tokenism. We're not talking about checking the box to say, I, I've got this person of color now in my ranks, I'm done. Um, we're actually talking about how do we create a culture within each of our environmental organizations that allows these young peoples to grow and thrive and continue to aspire to 
greater leadership opportunities as they grow professionally. So that's sort of the, the current day culture. Um, the last thing I will mention before I hand this over to David is around our historical culture. And this might create some enemies for me, but I'm going to say it anyways. The environmental movement that was begun in the early 19th century um, was not a movement that promoted inclusivity, right? We look at the early founding fathers of conservation and environmentalism, and we think of Teddy Roosevelt, uh, the president that created the national park system, America's greatest idea. We think of uh, uh, John Muir, um, a leading conservationist who also started the Sierra Club, one of the biggest environmental organizations in the nation. Um, we think about Madison Grant, um, the first director of the Forest Service. All of these guys were white men and all of them actually espoused to principles of systematic racism that we are ultimately struggling with today. So I wanna just name that a little bit. Um, the National was created and we love it, but it also was created uh, at the hands of displacing entire Native American populations from the lands that they lived in. Um, John Muir, the head of the, the Long Herald, was the father of the conservation movement, was also a well-known eugenicist. And when he started the Sierra Club and was president of the Sierra Club, he promoted sterilization of communities of color, of immigrants, because he believed that the population growth was out of control and that the more people we had in the world, the less natural resources we could have and the more these resources were gonna be extracted. So what that meant was that the Sierra Club, one of the leading environmental organizations in the world was promoting uh, essentially sterilization that hit women of color the hardest. So we have to kind of really understand some of that history to really know how to move forward as a movement today. Um, and so I think I'll, I'll stop there, um, but I'll also just chime in. There are some amazing resources that tell the full history of the conservation movement in this country. Um, Carolyn Merchant um, is a environmental historian that dives into some of that work, as is uh, Dorsetta Taylor. And I truly, truly believe as a Southerner growing up reading William Faulkner, one of the quotes that's always stuck to me is William Faulkner's quote that the past is never past and it actually is never dead. So a lot of what we need to understand about moving forward with a more equitable movement in the future is understanding our history um, because that's gonna be where we can understand how to break down some of these systemic barriers that may still be with us um, in the movement that we're trying to advance for our, a more equitable future for tomorrow. So I'll stop there. Great. Uh, well, I guess, Angelo, are you gonna? Oh, yes. Um, All right, cool. Thank you so much. I was trying to unmute here and I, I was able to do it. Uh, Bridget, thank you so much. I mean, you had you gave us so much to think about. And um, our next uh, uh, speaker of the night and our second uh, keynote speaker, you have already met, uh, Dr. Munoz from uh, Penn State. So without any further ado, let's... thank you. Great, thanks, Angelo. And um, you know, thanks, Bridget. I've got a tough act to follow. Um, so I'm gonna be putting on my consulting hat here and sharing with you a lot of the expertise I've learned uh, and experienced in working with organizations who care about increasing diversity uh, and more equitable and just uh, aspects of society. And so uh, just building off of Bridget's um, talk, I've, I know we are short on time, so I've shortened what I'm gonna talk about a little bit. 
Um, but my job here is to press you. And um, by you, I'm primarily talking to uh, leaders of environmental organizations, um, the white attendees of uh, this event. Um, and so I'm just gonna jump right in. And so I hope in me pressing you, um, I invite you to stay open, um, to listen and learn um, rather than uh, get defensive and close off because I know these, these topics can be challenging. So diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. So with this acronym DEIJ, we're gonna move from concepts to practice. Uh, yeah, let's just, let's just get going. So why do we do this? Fundamentally, if your organization is thinking about these things, what you should be framing it as is organizational change and adaptive leadership. Um, as Bridget mentioned, there is a long history of the environmental movement being built off of white supremacy. And so if your organization is unwilling to change or unwilling to acknowledge some of these things, then you're, you're stuck in uh, the past. Um, and so when we think about improving diversity within organizations within our field, we have to be willing to change to some point. We have to move out of maybe these areas where we're an unknowing participant in the systems around us. We have to engage with this new awareness of the things we're learning. We have to transform ourselves and our organizations so that way we can lead to actions for change and continue the cycle anew. And when we think about diversity, right, we're, and especially in the context of today's panel and uh, yeah, in today's panel, we're thinking about improving racial diversity uh, in uh, our field. And Bridget talked about tokenizing. This is not just, let's just add more people so we can say we did, we've checked our box because doing this actually can introduce people to a harmful environment for them. And so when we think about diversity by engaging people from different backgrounds and experiences, we can't ignore the methods that lead to diversity, which is equity, which is really about resources, justice, which is about who has power and who uh, gets to make decisions, and inclusion, which is the culture of our organizations, which as Bridget mentioned, is often the hardest thing to change. And so without addressing equity, justice, and inclusion in our field, we're creating uh, a harmful place for people um, from diverse backgrounds who might be joining our organizations or field. So these methods lead to a good uh, diverse outcome, but obviously it's challenging, right? Because those uh, racialized and ethnic minorities, they're often the ones who have the most insight to share and the highest expertise in uh, designing and leading some of these methods. So it's two way street, but we can't achieve diversity unless we're willing to change the ways we use our resources, the ways in which we give power and the ways in which we design the culture of our organizations. And one thing that you know, we think about when we herald um, the benefits of diversity, right? There's lots of evidence showing that diverse teams are better at problem solving, that diverse companies can weather economic hardship and have, be more successful. Um, diversity just has all these positive attributes um, that can help us tackle the environmental problems that we face today as a society, environmental and social. And one thing that's important to emphasize is that this diversity, the reason it's so beneficial is because of conflict. Conflict is the encounter between different perspectives and it's this offering of different perspectives that makes us so strong. And when we can honor those different perspectives within our organizations, we can truly collaborate. We can create something new. We can solve problems in new and different ways. We can make society the place that we want it to be. The problem is, is that a lot of us have fear when it comes to conflict. And what this fear does is it changes a healthy thing such as conflict and turns it into combat where we're struggling to eliminate different perspectives, right? Uh, we can all see this in the political uh, realm of our society, our country today. It's that we're not interested in learning. Uh, we're interested in eliminating the other side. 
But also, on a positive thing, fear can also turn something like collaboration into conformity, where instead of celebrating the differences that people bring to our organizations, really what we want is them to have a sense of forced togetherness. We don't really want conflict because we're afraid of it. And so we turn these really positive things such as conflict and collaboration into negative things like combat and conformity. And so thinking about these different tools, so, diver so equity, inclusion, justice, thinking about the mindsets we might bring through uh, our openness to conflict, our willing to engage with it, we have to also think about our spheres of influence. All of us here have some influence that we can exert in society. The easiest one is we can change ourselves. It's harder when we start to think about our interpersonal relationships. And it gets even more confusing when we start thinking about our social institutions and the communities around us. But we have to address things on all of these scales because no amount of individual change is gonna change the systems that we participate in. And so uh, in my shortened time here, cause I wanna hear from you all um, is I'm gonna give a brief idea of like what the right mindset or what a good mindset might be to engaging in these topics. And then I'll go into just a handful of things organizations can be doing. Uh, but you know, these are conversations that need to be a lifelong journey. So the mindset, the first is you need to deprioritize your own comfort. People of color and minoritized groups all the time are having to put themselves in spaces where people are saying harmful things, whether intentionally or unintentionally. They're watching a society around them tries to discredit and undermine the claims that they make about, right? I mean, Black Lives Matter. Like it's not saying black lives should thrive. It's starting at the point of society doesn't even demonstrate that black lives matter. And so all the time communities of color are advocating for their basic right to exist and their ability to thrive. But whenever we talk about race or racism or white supremacy, oftentimes uh, the defenses go up and the white people in those conversations um, are interested more in maintaining their comfort than in learning something new. So remember, conflict is healthy. How can we learn to deprioritize our own comfort in these conversations? The second is to truly believe that we have the capacity to change ourselves in society, right? In the environmental field, we're all some degrees of idealists. We believe that we can change the world around us. And unless we truly believe that we can change our society and the dynamics and culture within it, um, we need that to fuel um, our actions because cynicism just upholds the status quo. So here's just two aspects of the mindset that we might need. But thinking about this mindset and thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, you know, is your organization ready to undertake some of these things? So I'm gonna show a few different, several different quotes um, that I think represent a lot of the struggles in the environmental organizations I've worked with of just, you know, indicating that they're not ready yet. So one, hear this quite a bit, candidates from racialized or ethnic backgrounds are less qualified or capable. If you have people who are influencing hiring organization that say this in some form or fashion, you've got some learning to do. If you're approaching diversity, equity, and inclusion as, you know, and when I say we here, I'm saying the white perspective, if we're the only ones with something to offer, then you're ignoring the fact that uh, people from marginalized backgrounds are bringing with them not only their content expertise of whatever field they're in, but also the expertise of uh, bringing about this positive change within your organizations. So you're not the only ones with something to offer in this relationship. I've also heard, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, it's good talk and it's good PR for an organization. And that's sort of where the buck stops. This isn't about what's good for your organization. You shouldn't be using this as a self-serving tool. You need to be thinking about centering 
the well-being of uh, those in your organization from racialized backgrounds, um, and making sure that this is really about making sure everyone can thrive in your organization, not just what makes you look good. A lot, especially with uh, the movements from this past year, um, sparked by George Floyd, is so many organizations think that advocating for social justice is political, whereas their environmental missions aren't. And this just can't be further from the truth. Every cause is political, and you need to think hard about which ones scare you to engage with, like social justice, and which ones seem like an inherent right or an inherently good cause, because you can't really be separating the two. And lastly, uh, a lot of organizations I've worked with is they're afraid to lose members or lose donors if they start prioritizing equity, inclusion, or justice in their organization. And I think you have to ask yourself, you know, what's your organization going to be in 10 years? What is the values you truly want to espouse? Because if you honor anything, any of these statements on this list, you're really upholding white supremacy. And I'm going to use the term white supremacy, and I know many of you might recoil at this and say, no, I'm not racist. But you know that's a discussion for another time. The problem is white supremacy, this ideology, is embedded in so many of the ways in which our organizations think. And we have to challenge these ideas head on. And so thinking about diversity or engaging communities of color or trying to recruit more communities of color, if your organization is grappling with some of these ideas on this slide, maybe you're not ready. Maybe you need to take some more time to do the learning to transform yourselves before you bring people in to a harmful work environment. Lastly, uh, you know, what is your motivation and commitment? You know, everyone in your organization should be aligned with why you're doing this work or why you're engaging with this work if you haven't been doing so in the past. Because this is hard, it's a lifelong journey. Um, this isn't sort of a one and done thing where we do a little bit of work, then we get tired out and we drop out um, because that's sort of the status quo. Um, so, before you start engaging in this work, you need to be really clear about why you're doing it and what level of commitment you're truly willing to give. So as I move into the last couple slides here on actions you can take, we gotta keep the mindset in the back of our minds, you know, where is our organization at? But we also need to think about um, different types of approaches. And I'm just gonna briefly cover some top-down approaches from leadership and boards and some bottom-up approaches that affect all staff. Um, and so one thing that everyone in your organization can do is actually listen. So maybe you already have um, staff in your organization um, who are racial or ethnic minorities. And my guess is there is that time spoken up and offered things to your organization and if your organization is like most, you acknowledge them, but then never act on them, or you question them. And I have this quote here from Audre Lorde that when we, people of color, speak, we are afraid of our words will not be heard or welcomed, but when we are silent, so we're still afraid, so it's better to speak. And so when you have people who are sharing their experiences and insights with your primarily white organization, it's coming at a great personal cost to them. There's professional retribution that they're afraid of. There's the emotional labor they're putting into sharing their experience and insight. And it upholds white supremacy to not believe those experiences when they're shared. So I encourage you to actually listen. You also have to do the work. This quote here from James Baldwin speaking about white people, they are in effect still trapped in a history which they do not understand. Until they understand it, they cannot be released from it. Right, we've talked about leaky pipeline. Um, other folks in the pen panel have mentioned uh, sort of this idea of an underrepresented group. It's not underrepresented, it didn't just happen. 
this history comes from a history of marginalization and intended exclusion, as Bridget was saying. The outcomes we see today were by design. And if you can't recognize that, you need to start doing the work, digging deeper to have that understanding, to have that history, so you can understand the context in which we're operating in. Because personal transformation and doing the work to transform yourselves is a necessary ingredient. Thinking about top down, uh, and I'm just gonna load all of these so you can read them. One thing I wanna emphasize uh, on this slide is if your leadership isn't on board to change or adapt, then you're sort of bound. Um, and you need to ask yourself, is this the right leader for us? Because otherwise you're gonna be plagued by retention issues. People are gonna be leaving your organization because they're realizing that the buck is stopping at leadership and there's not gonna be the advancement opportunities those folks need in your organization. I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the next slide. So hopefully you have a chance to read some of these. But thinking about things for all of your staff, once again, in the interest of time, I'm gonna load all of them. And I'm just gonna, you know, Bridget already talked about free labor and funding your uh, internships. But one thing to think about is do all employees, regardless of level in their organization, are you investing in their professional development? Are you telling them that they're valued? Because oftentimes it's only certain types of employees in your organization who might be valued. It might only be middle management. It might only be leadership. Uh, and if you're wanting to have a truly inclusive organization, you need to be equitable in who you're investing in. And so with that, uh, that's just my short little bit. So I wanna say thank you. Um, here's my email address if any of you wanna contact me and expand this conversation more. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen um, and look for questions. Thank you so much. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, uh, have then, uh, if you have questions, you can just send them directly to the chat and then David and Bridget, you can um, feel them and answer um, however you uh, would like to feel them. So those of you with questions, um, please send them in. Does anyone have questions? It's awfully quiet. Um, I know it's late, but I think this is a good opportunity for people to, um, you know, you know, post something. You can even send it privately, and, and it can be anonymous to me, and I'll, I'll ask it. Or um, if you want to, you can also email um, either David or Bridget um, or me. Um, my email contact information was on the flyer, um, and we can ask these questions later. Okay, here's one. Looks like Neha is asking, what are some ways to get leaders, the board or executive leadership? What are some um, ways to get leaders? Yeah, for um, board executive leadership on board. Um, Bridget, do you want to go first or I can take a stab? Uh, sure, I'm happy to take a stab at that. Um, I think David's absolutely right to call out the importance of leadership and board leadership, particularly amongst environmental organizations that are predominant, predominantly white organizations. I think it is important for us to, to recognize that um, of all the traditional, I would say mainstream environmental organizations, we are still struggling with a diversity problem 90% of our staff and board and workforce are white and um, middle and upper class. Um, so, so this remains a struggle for the environmental movement. I do think it's important to recognize that a direct um, challenge to that is the environmental justice movement, which emerged in the 1980s. 
as a direct statement to uh, basically criticize the mainstream environmental organizations for not doing enough to think about public health, um, i.e. putting the needs of nature above the needs of low income residents and communities of color. So the environmental justice movement, I think is important for us to note here. It emerged in the 1980s, it's growing. Um, and, and that is a group, a, a subsect within the environmental movement that is uh, predominantly led by communities of color at both the board and the staff level. Uh, so there is that subsect within the environmental movement that is actually quite diverse um, and focused on issues uh, that intersect with environmental justice, with Black Lives Matter, with all, a whole range of um, issues trying to fight industrial pollution being cited disproportionately in communities of color and poor communities. So I do wanna recognize the environmental justice community as part of this. I think for mainstream and predominantly white organizations, um, for better, for worse, one of the things that has worked for me, uh, because we struggle, and I have struggled personally throughout my life with issues of white guilt, once you realize and, and break down some of these issues and you start to realize that conservation has been inextricably connected uh, with issues of white dominance, to the point where some critics of the environmental community will say, you, want, you guys want to conserve nature, but you also want to conserve the white race. Um, these are legitimate concerns founded in, in history. However, what I have found to be effective is as I speak with my white colleagues in the environmental movement, to recognize that we ourselves in this generation might not have been responsible for historical racism of the early 1900s, from leaders like John Muir, um, the idea that it's not necessarily my fault that these inequities exist, but it certainly is my responsibility to figure out how we move forward from here. That takes a little bit of the white guilt off of people um, and also enables what, more white folks to not shut down, but realize they are part of the solution, right? white folks need to be just as involved in leading these issues of equity um, as communities of color. If we are not, our whole movement and our whole sector will fail. So one of the basic things we've tried to do at Groundwork, we still have more work to do. I would say we're at our organization, we're about 40% representation um, from communities of color on our staff and on our board. We still have more work to do um, on that. But we have initiated simple things like um, when we have a new job opportunity or when we have a new board position open, we don't just post the job position on our website. We actually are actively engaged in trying to ensure that before we even begin an interview process for a new board candidate or for a new staff position, we ensure that there is a diverse applicant pool, whatever it takes to make sure that we have a diverse applicant pool before we even begin to interview for those positions, we ensure that. Um, so there are basic uh, systemic processes like that, that we can begin to institutionalize and make a norm within our organizations versus just posting a job description on our website and saying, woe is me, no people of color applied to this, therefore, people of color aren't interested in this environmental job. Um, we actually need to do the extra work to ensure a diverse applicant pool before we interview for any new positions. That doesn't guarantee a person of color will get the job, but it certainly guarantees that we've done our due diligence, we've done our homework, we've looked outside of our traditional recruitment channels to ensure that we have an applicant pool that is reflective of the community that we serve. So there are basic things like that, that we're trying to institutionalize at Groundwork um, that I think has uh, demonstrated success. I mean, at 40% folks of color versus 10% across the environmental field, we feel like simple but concrete actions like that can go a long way to making sure that we're leveling the playing field 
for candidacy uh, for job opportunities and board roles throughout the organization. Any, any other questions? Okay, um, so um, Danielle, that's it. Wanna, wanna come yeah. in and let me know uh, if we should then close or? Yeah, so we're five after eight. I'm, I just wanna thank everybody for participating, all the panelists and the participants. And I know two hours is a long time, but this is a, a really important topic um, that really you need you know, a lifetime journey, basically, as David mentioned, to really even begin to understand how to how to make these opportunities for people and um, to, to change, you know, the culture at organizations and also, um, you know, do our best to 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 be representative of, of, you know, what the world looks like, right? Like, it's not lack of interest. It's, it's again, exclusionary, the way that we've done things. So I, I'm really happy that we were able to um, have this panel and, and talk to everybody. And I do think um, we have a lot of great questions we didn't answer today. And, and I will put together the chat. I need to go through things. It's gonna take me probably tomorrow to get through everything. Um, and I will send it to the panelists. I will also be sending out um, a post survey um, to the email to everybody who registered regarding your, your experience today. Um, and I wanna get some feedback. T-Town is exploring other options for panels like this and we want to get feedback on how this went today. So um, with that, I again, thank everybody. Um, I'm gonna hang around for a few minutes just to make sure everybody gets logged off. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, it is again on the flyer.